Huggins, in a court situation, I do have the right to express my own opinion. Now, of course, my opinion is based on these 300,000 data points of blood chemistry information over 42 years. And the uh, this part never came out, but uh, my trial did go to the appellate court or the Supreme Court, whatever it was, and uh, they voted 3-0 that it should be absolutely, it was the dumbest suit that they had ever seen, and it should never have been brought to trial. And that the person they used as the scapegoat to sue me in this should pay my legal fees, <clears throat> which were substantial. That's what broke me financially. But, get this, she declared bankruptcy so she would not have to pay, pay my attorney's fees. But two years later, she made a cash offer on a building of $960,000. Now, where would you find $960,000 tax-free in two years? <clears throat> yeah, there were several people who brought to my attention what had been done there, but it was the smartest thing the Dental Association ever did because it scared all the dentists into going back, placing amalgam, and not putting the Dental Association in the crosshairs. So, you know, they've had 30, 40 years of, they are a very large organization, like $2 billion, and um, nobody is bothering them. Some of the original people, it's a privately held club is what it is. It's not really a professional organization like the AMA and Nurses Association and so on. But dentists have bought into it. I did. I didn't find this out until just a few years ago. But, um, well, that gets into a political mess. And there's no point in going there. It doesn't have anything to do with dental decay. Don't you think that a lot of dentists, once they learn what you're talking about, if they're committed to serving their patients, they would start to place a different type of material in the mouth, not only not mercury, but maybe not even composite? Yes. In fact, we now, I just heard a report a few days ago that 52% of the dentists do not place mercury anymore. So we passed over the halfway point, but to carry it to the extreme, uh, there may be a half a dozen dentists in the United States. Well, we'd have to include a few foreign countries, too. Maybe we could get a half a dozen who would do everything in accordance to, well, basically what I found, you know, 40-some years ago, I made a lot of mistakes that I don't make today. And this is what I teach is... Taking multiple sclerosis, when we first started, we had 10% success rate. Then we found something that pushed it up to 20. Then we found something that pushed it up to 40. Now we're up over 90%. So it's the things that we did 40 years ago that we don't do today and the things we do do that make not only multiple sclerosis but a whole lot of the, quote, incurable diseases uh, come out of it, but the important thing is those diseases do not have to happen. Multiple sclerosis started in 1832 in Paris. Just by some coincidence, the first commercially placed amalgams were placed in 1832 in Paris. Wow. And if you look at leukemia, it's the same pattern. When they came out with a high copper amalgam in 76, um, Immediately, everybody adopted it because it was an ADA product. It was a product developed by the American Dental Association. The five years preceding 1976, MS, multiple sclerosis, was occurring uh, an average of 8,800 times a year. Then in 76, it went from 8,800 to 123,000 the next year and it's been on an upward swing since then. Well, the high copper amalgam produces 50 times more mercury and 50 times more copper than the amalgam from 1975. Did you see that on the front page of the newspaper? Is that not significant that we went from 8,800 to 123,000 on the way up? But no, that was not brought forward, and it is... <laughs> You can go to the Centers for Disease Control, and hey, that's what their statistics are. Now uh, let's go back to some of the original vote of what causes dental decay. The Dental Association voted that the hardness of the enamel 
was related to susceptibility to decay, and that's why they came out with fluoride to harden the surface of the enamel. Well, studies that uh, Steinman did showed that the hardness of the enamel had absolutely nothing to do with the tendency of dental decay. And I just heard yesterday a very frightening story to me. A gal called and said she has an eight-year-old son who is totally decay-free. He's never had a cavity. And the dentist said, oh, these teeth are soft. We better put chrome crowns on all of them to prevent them from getting decay. That's crazy. Well, the chrome crowns is a cutesy name for a nickel product. And nickel is carcinogenic. It gives the body the idea of developing cancer at some point down the line. And it really messes up the urogenital system, the reproductive system and everything, which you don't need to do in five, six, seven, eight-year-olds, but that's what is very, very popular in children now. You have a cavity, hey, just stick a whole crown on it because they're preformed. It doesn't take you but a few minutes to make one and stick it on, and there's a lot of good money to be made in that. Well, one of Steinman's studies that I found, the last one I'll talk about here, was uh, heredity. And uh, Steinman had kind of a, a subtle sense of humor, and uh, they didn't always let him publish his subtle sense of humor. But he found that uh, heredity in examining that, he found that diabetes and dental decay went very closely together, and they were found in families whether the children were natural or adopted as long as they ate breakfast at the same table each day. Wow. Uh, heredity, no. Heredity is not the problem. It's your body chemistry. It's your phosphorus going below 3.5. It's a lack of protein in the diet. And at some point in time, yeah, you should brush your teeth. I'm not saying don't brush your teeth. In fact, for gum disease, I've got a, a 1.3 cent cure for gum disease. I mean, it's 1.3 cents a day. It's not for the whole treatment. Are you talking about flossing? No. It's a matter of using a very strong salt water solution. Uh, we've had this demonstrated uh, recently where there's a former employee of mine uh, from 20 years ago came in and said, hey, they want so many thousand dollars to cut off my gums here. I've got six millimeter pockets around, which is the the moat around the tooth, and they want to cut them off, and it's going to be expensive, and you know I'm retired, and it's it's going to hurt. And um, she had um, three months before they were going to do this surgery, and I thought, oh, this is a short period of time, but let's give it a try. Put a half a teaspoon of salt in the palm of your hand, lick it off with your tongue and then put about a tablespoon of uh, warm water in your mouth and aggressively flush it in between the teeth up and now just really <laughs> get with it and i was the one who was most surprised about this she went in for the surgery they got everything ready tipped her back and he started uh, looking for the pocket depths to decide how much to cut off he couldn't find one deeper than two millimeters, which is normal health. And he says, you get out of my chair. You don't need any surgery. So in three months' time, the pox is gone from six. We have seen bone growth and stuff like that due to balancing the chemistry. But I had no idea we could take six-millimeter pockets and bring them down to two. But this was a specialist in periodontics who just lost a whole lot of money by finding that uh, he was honest and saying, hey, the pockets aren't there to be cut off anymore. And that was just salt, pure, well, it is not sea salt. And that's a long story, which we're not going to go into. But there's one that does a very good job called pickling and canning salt. And Morton's makes most of it. Some of it, I think, Ball makes. But the pickling and canning salt has the lowest level of aluminum in it of any of them. So that's why we picked it for our general balancing of chemistry. But for gums, good grief does it cause the gums to come back into line. I have really been surprised. I knew it would help, but I didn't know it was going to create miracles. But really, at about a penny a day, I don't know, It's around here you get the salt, it's uh, $2 for four pounds. You know, that's enough to last all month. So it's really a very inexpensive way, and talk about killing bacteria. Well, have you ever had a sore throat and gargle with salt water? 
Right, but I don't know why it works.